Okay, so this is the third video. Somebody, we were just on our second video, um, but somebody called me and it messed up the sound. So if you are new to this video, make sure to watch the two videos prior to this. And on YouTube, I'll put the links below. Um, so you can pick up where you're leaving off about Donald Trump. Well, what I'm saying is, is that, um, what I'm saying is that Donald Trump, when I met Donald Trump, he was in the boxing business, right? That was a great obsession of the moment. He wanted to be the biggest site promoter in boxing. Now, what I mean by site promoter? Um, Madison Square Garden used to be the foremost venue for boxing in America. Some of the fights, at one point, I think Madison Square Garden was the promoter. But as fighters began, but a lot of fighters always had, like Joe Lewis, he always had two promoters that were black numbers bankers. These were gentlemen gangsters here. Uh, 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 Joe Lewis's managers. People think that Jacobs, the, the Jewish guy, was Joe Lewis's manager. He wasn't. He was the promoter. His managers were two black number bankers, one from Detroit and one from Chicago, real gentlemen gangsters. You know? So in any case, like Don King, you know, in, in any case, uh, he was, King was trying, uh, Trump was trying to take big time boxing away from Las Vegas. And what I'm saying, the reason that boxing promoters like to promote fights in casinos rather than say Madison Square Garden is because there's so many advantages. You know, um, now the reason I know about this is because I was a boxing promoter and I started out working for a world champion as a, as a press agent for Michael Spinks right after he won uh, the, the light, light heavyweight champion, he was already a gold medalist. And Butch Lewis hired me. That's another story. I, I do, we'll do a whole thing on my experience in the boxing business. I got in it and, you know, cause I had, that was quite an adventure. But suffice it to say that the reason I happened to be at this, well, the biggest fight in the history of boxing was coming up. The unification, the heavyweight unification match between Michael Spinks uh, and Mike Tyson. And everybody was vying to get it. This was, this was the get. And Trump had to have it for his new casino in Atlantic City. And if, if he got it, it would be the ultimate, his ultimate triumph over a, a, a win, Steve Wynn, out of the Sands in Vegas. So in order for him to do that, he had to get, he had to get, he had to get the uh, consent from Don King, who was God you know, in this situation. Don King controlled the heavyweight division, you know, and was nobody going to get the site rights that he didn't want to have it, but it was a joint promotion with him and Butch Lewis because both of them had a champion. Both, both of them had a part of the belt. Mike had the WBA championship. Mike, uh, Mike thinks Tyson had the WBC championship. So this was a, a heavyweight unification fight and between uh, two undefeated fighters. You know, so this, so this, 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 this is big. You know, and 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 uh, so Trump managed to get it, and when he got it for his casino, which was in Atlantic City, he gave a big party to celebrate. He invited the Spinks camp and the Tyson camp, and I was with the Spinks camp. That's how I happened to go there, right? Now, in the boxing business, it's funny because guys have their own language. Like, they'll say, you know, you have these camps, you know, these entourages around these fighters. And the way they talk, they'll say, we want Tyson. We want Tyson. Now, ain't nobody going to be in the ring but the boxer, but they be talking a lot of shit. Everybody in the group be woofing, you know. We want Tyson. We want the, or we want Spain. So, I'm up in there, and when I see Mike Tyson coming in, I was getting ready to stepped to him and said, we want Tyson. I took one look at Mike Tyson looked like he would kick your ass. <laughs> I'm serious. He, you know, like a lot of fighters are very mild-mannered out of the ring. Like Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was a pussycat. Mike Tyson looked like he would kick your ass at the drop of a hat. And I was getting ready to say it, and I thought, no, I don't want Tyson. I think I'm just going to chill on this. You know what I'm saying? Because first of all, this was a posh affair. Michael Spinks had on a satin tuxedo with silk bow tie. Mike like, Tyson? No, Mike, Mike. No, not Mike Tyson. Michael Spinks. Oh, Michael Spinks. You know? okay. And you know, Spinks was tall and like a built like a model anyway. And Spinks looked like a Paris parlor pimp. You understand? Know He's all perfume. Mm -hmm. Mike Tyson came in there. He looked like 
it was it. This was right after Trump had bought this hotel that he calls the Trump Palace. It used to be the Carlisle House, right? And he threw the party in there, right? So, so uh, this is right across the street from Central Park, from the northern entrance at 59th Street, right? And so uh, Tyson walked in there. He looked like he had fell asleep in the park <laughs> the day before. All right, because he was not dressed anywhere like nobody. I mean, he came in there, he had on, he didn't have on no socks. Uh, he had one part of his shirt out of his pants, you know. Mm. And the nigga just looked evil. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying, I mean, I saw him, I said, I, I'm, I'm as far away from him as I can, right? You know what I'm saying? But he looked like he just woke up and said, oh, shit, I'm supposed to be at this thing. And just got up out under the tree and came on in there. That's, I'm serious, that's what he looked like. Now, his wife, Robin. She was in there looking like Jackie Kennedy, because you know she went to Sarah Lawrence. She's a Sarah Lawrence girl. She's very highly educated. If you look at those interviews with them, when they were on one of these shows, and somebody said, "Well, what do you have in common?" She said, "Well, we have a lot in common. <laughs> they ain't got nothing in common." One of these comedians say, "I ain't never seen nobody that'll tell you right off when they're doing some far shit. You can just ask them a question and tell you, say, like Robin Gibbons." So you ask her, what would you, what'd you do? She said, Robin Tyson. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was wild. Now, in the piece, I talk in the piece, all right, about having too much champagne and stumbling off and stumbling into the wrong room and walked up on Donald Trump making out with Robin Gibbons. Yeah, I said it. Y'all like it? I wrote it before and I say it again. Sue me. That's what... And see, I didn't know he'd do that shit. See, when he said that, when that came out, when he said, well, when you're a star, you know, you can do anything. You can grab my pussy. I say, I know. Now I know that that shit he do all the time. You understand what I'm saying? At the time, I didn't know it. I just thought, this nigga got... This crack guy, he got a lot of heart. Mike Tyson is out here. You know, suppose it had been him that stumbled in there and we'd have had a homicide on our hands. But that's how arrogant Donald Trump was, right? Now, so I decided to pay close attention to him the rest of the night. It's all in the piece, you know? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all in the piece, right? Let me just say this. Here's my impression of Donald, Donald Trump. This is what I said. This is how I described him. I said he's the shallowest person I have ever met. I said, he is as shallow as a dry creek bed doing a drought. Read it. I wrote it here. It said, that's how I described it. I said, there's nothing to this guy. He was all bullshit. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, he was all bull And he was kissing Don King's ass all over the place. All right? Running around like a little butt boy in there with Don King. I thought he was a chump. You understand? And I still think he's a fucking chump. You understand? And I ain't impressed with nothing he did at business. If my dad had left me $400 uh, million, dollars, I would be richer than that asshole, that South African asshole, what's his name? Um, Elon uh, Musk. Elon Musk, that asshole. I'd be richer than him if my dad had left me $400 million. So I ain't impressed with that shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying I know, I, I evaluate people based upon their strength of character and intellect. I don't give a shit what kind of, you know, worldly goods you've got because I've known too many idiots who were rich. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not, I'm not impressed with that. You know, and so Trump, I paid close attention to him. And I thought, there's nothing to this guy. You know, this guy is all bullshit. There's nothing to him. So then I see this motherfucker come up running for president. I thought it was a joke. I said, well, he's just trying to get big up his name, you know, so he can get him a TV network or something, right? And the sucker run around, messed around and won. I mean... I know there's a lot of dumb people in this country. You understand what I'm saying? Believe, believe, believe me, you understand what I'm saying? But it, you know, like P.T. Bonham has said, you can never go broke underestimating the taste of the American people. But, I mean... I mean... Yeah, I, I, I mean, this guy, I mean, how could you not see through this shallow, you know, uh, megalomaniacal... Idiot. Well, let me tell you yes, something. Yeah. Like, so many, there's so many black people, of course, not the black people that I know and hang out with, but there's so many black people who, especially you could say maybe in hip-hop culture or whatever, just who think, you know, they're like pro-Donald Trump, and they have so much negative stuff to say about Obama. Like, Obama's our enemy. 
But then they think Donald Trump is great. And it makes absolutely no let me, sense. Let me tell you something. Here's the problem. The problem is that we're suffering from an epidemic of ignorance. Kanye West. Kanye West is a babbling fucking idiot. And you got all these people going, he's a genius. Yeah, you know why? Kanye. Because, yeah, because, yeah. because too many people think just because you have money... Then that makes you like people. Are, well, how can he not be a genius if he's a billionaire? It is, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you don't right. have to be a genius right. to become a billionaire. Yeah. To me, being a billionaire, like like my, my mother is, uh, you know, an international labor organizer. She's been a labor organizer all my life and involved in the politics. And she can't stand billionaires running for office. And to me, when I think about like, especially if someone's obsessed with being a billionaire. Like to me, Oprah's a billionaire, but I feel like she, I don't. I don't feel like she became a billionaire because she was obsessed with it, right? No. And yeah. Oprah puts her money into very important projects. But when somebody is obsessed about becoming a billionaire, like that's your goal in life. To me, I look at you sideways because that means to me, I see somebody who will do anything to become rich, who will do anything for money. First of all, let me you tell know? you something. If I had a billion dollars, I would get up and do essentially the same things I get up and do now, you know, because that's what I care about. That's what gives me joy in life, you know, to sit down. Uh, to look at the world and be able to know what's going on and to write pieces to tell people, listen, you should look for this, you should look for that. You know, uh, the constant learning, which we call the life of the mind. You know what I mean? Uh, I've had a, I've had a varied life. You know, I've been a lot of things. You know, and anybody who would like to see the range of my life experiences, just go on Playthell's commentaries. Dot word. That's P L A Y T H E L L S. No apostrophe. PlaySellsCommentaries.wordpress.com. As a matter of fact, maybe you could put the link yeah, on the well, video or something. You know, yeah, so. I'll put it below. Yeah, okay. So you can you just go to it and look at the, and look under the essay that says um, that says uh, PlaySell Benjamin, independent public intellectual. And then there's another thing that says another one that says mission statement. You should read that too, so you see what I'm doing. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to be launching a new two channel soon called Commentaries on the Times, even though you can find me on YouTube now, you know, you can find me on there with Bill Ma, you know, you can find me on there, uh, you know, you know, talking about the the, um, the the Iraq war, you can find me on, on YouTube and debates, I mean, uh, you know, I got a healthy presence there right now, find me on there playing congas, mm -hmm. find me on there playing congas with Zone Del Barrio, dancing the mambo, all kinds of stuff on YouTube, you know. But I'm getting ready to do this channel, you know, where I'm going to just do my serious commentaries, you know, that I've been doing on the radio and that I've been writing about. But yes, so that's my that's the first um, my first impressions of Donald Trump. But now, I have written a series of essays on Donald Trump since he became uh, president. Since he started running, I started writing when he was running for president. In one of these conversations, because these are series that I'm doing with my daughter, she has been badgering me about this because I'll be sitting around the house talking with her, and she's saying, Daddy, other people should be hearing this. Other people should be hearing this. I mean, I mean, people don't know about it, all these things you're talking. You should be so... I, she, she, she talked me into doing this series called Conversations with My Dad. So we will be talking about all kinds of things, because I write about a lot. Let me just put it this way, all right? Mm. My natural modesty makes it difficult for me to say this. <laughs> I got to try. You know what I mean? No, you're, See, you're a lot like Muhammad but, you know, but I mean, I have to try because of it. You know, people say, you know, that sucker got a big head. Well, but, 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 listen, but, oh, listen. Mm -hmm. my head may be of generous proportions, but it's not because it's fat. And it's not because it's swollen with conceit. It is pregnant with knowledge. <laughs> well, the thing is, your you, your your confidence in shit talking sometimes reminds me a lot of Muhammad Ali. But you guys came from the same time. Well, Muhammad you was born my the man. same year. I know, and you guys are born in the same year. And when you put things in the context, you know. Well, let me tell you this: Muhammad Ali was the perfect champion for my generation. Right? We. It's not an accident that the blacks student movement, this youth movement, began at the time that it did. I went to Florida A&M in 1959. My ambition was to become a lawyer. I wanted to be the next Thurgood Marshall, you know, and fight civil rights cases. Uh, that was in 1959, the fall of 1959. 
some of your mamas wasn't in school in 1959. That's how long I've been around, you know? And I'm still, as you can see, you know, sharp, you know, is an is a, is a ax. And this is just this is, this is vicious too, you know? Anyway, anyway, the thing is, is that, um, Mom and Ali was the perfect champion for my generation because we had had enough of these white folks, you know? We had enough. And we just rose in, I mean, at one point we just started, fuck it, I know how I felt, you know? And we, we, when I got involved, I got involved in the student sit-ins in about the second it started in Greensboro, North Carolina. And then it began to just spread all over the South. I was at Florida and then we were like the second or third school to get involved in sit-ins, you know? My mother called me up in the dorm. She said, are you involved in this trouble I've seen up there on the news? I said, yeah, I sure, yeah, I am, sure am. She said, but you can't do that. You know, she said, you could get, you're my only son. You know, you're my son. You could, so I, I, I remember telling her, listen, mom, everybody up here is somebody's son. And when I got through talking to her, she just said, well, I'll pray for you. But she and I said, I got to do this, you know, and she understood it, you know. Now, I have never stopped fighting yet. I'm still fighting, you know. Right now, I ain't going to be on no goddamn picket line because I'm 80 years old, but I tell you what, I'm writing treatises that if people read them and pay attention to them, the enemy is going to be in trouble. And I'm not writing to the untutored mob, you know. And when I'm on the radio, I try to enlighten the untutored mob, but when I'm writing, I'm writing to people who know how to read and can deal with complex ideas. And, 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 so I'm here to teach the teachers, all right? I'm here to teach the people who are going to teach the masses, you know? I'm a, I'm a mastermind. I cannot write, you know, for, for the untutored mob. I saw some idiot who calls himself the professor. I don't know who he is. He, he, he doesn't give his name, but he appears on Facebook and whatnot. Now, he's attacked two people. I've read two, two pieces he wrote. The first one he attacked was uh, Michael Eric Dyson. And the second one he attacked was uh, Grandmaster Jay, the guy who was leading the not fucking around coalition, the armed militia in the South. Call him an agent. He's in jail. You understand what I'm saying? For arming, uh, arming and organizing black people. He's in jail. All these white boys walking around out here with guns. He's in jail. That's how much they don't want black people to get the idea that the Second Amendment also belongs to us. And this guy who calls himself the professor says he's an agent. And you know who he was defending? Kanye West. Mm, that's ridiculous. That's who he, and he calls himself the professor. Now, here's what I want to say to him or any of you all who know him or, or, or see his stuff. Tell him I said this. You know, tell him that I said that he looks like the one who's an agent. Why is he hiding? Who is he scared of? Why does he, it's somebody who takes the position he took in these two cases has either got to be a damn fool or agent provocateur, a traitor. And the stuff is too cleverly written for him to be a fool. So I have to believe he's an agent. So I want to say this to this guy who calls himself the professor and has attacked Michael Eric Dyson and attacked uh, 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 Grandmaster J, the, the militia leader. Here's what I want to say to you. I think you're a pussy, all right? You're scared to show, you, you, you throw the brick and hide your hand, you're scared to say who you are. Step up, step, if you're a professor, I'm a real professor, step to me. I can't say what I want to say because they might throw us off uh, 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 YouTube or Instagram, whatever. But I'm going to just tell you this. Before you think about it, there's two things you need to consider. Your intellectual reputation and your mental health, your mental stability, because I'm gonna put an ass whipping on you if you step to me. And not only that, let me just tell you this. I'm a 30 year radio producer at WBI. I can get a special and put you and I live in a debate on the radio that can be streamed around the world. Everybody can see what an asshole you are, okay? An asshole. Now, I'm not hiding. I'm Place L. Benjamin. I said it a minute, and I'm ready to step up and represent it. You, 
who call yourself a professor, you are fake, and you are the agent. Okay, how dare you call Grandmaster Jay an agent and speak about Michael Eric Dyson, a guy whose drawers you're not fit to wash. Michael Eric Dyson. Michael Eric Dyson. And let me tell you something. Me and Michael Eric Dyson, we have not always agreed. Me and Michael Eric Dyson have had some, we had a, a national debate on CBS radio. Me and Michael Eric Dyson. Another time we had a debate on the floor of the Pennsylvania legislature. All right? And, 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 and it was about gangster rap. So, so Michael Eric Dyson and I have had some knockdown, but Michael Eric Dyson is one of the most brilliant men in the country. Michael Eric Dyson got a PhD in philosophy from Princeton in about, well, let's put it this way, the fastest ever. The fastest ever. Hmm. Michael Eric Dyson took his oral exams and after you take your orals, they call it ABD if you pass them, all but dissertation. Michael Eric Dyson passed his oral exams and reached in his briefcase and handed the dissertation to his professors, and he had his PhD within a matter of a month or so, all right? In philosophy, that ain't no bullshit subject, philosophy, all right? So this little, I have to watch my mouth, because if I say what I want to say, they really go put us up. Let me just say this to you. Uh, you fake, you agent who calls yourself the professor. Here's what I want to say. Step to a real professor, all right? Step to me, okay? And I, like I say, all you need to consider is your intellectual reputation and your mental stability. And listen, because here's the thing. I'm a street boy. I'm mean. And I got a real dirty motherfucking mouth. Instead of say so, if you want to debate me, and plus I'm smarter than almost everybody I know. All right, I, I usually don't like to say shit like that, but it's true. No, <laughs> it, it is. It is it's true. It's true. It is true. If y'all don't think it's true, read my stuff. I mean, th th there's tons of people who've been who've been commenting about 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 you. Now, let me say, okay, so somebody asked this question. I already know your answer, but this is good to go into some of the founding of the Black Panthers because. Um, somebody just asked if um, is actually I could say a Haitian, um, uh, maybe he's Haitian American, but he said, "Do you think that voting has been good for Black Americans?" Fucking right. What kind of question is that? What kind of question is that? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. that. What kind of question is that? Has voting been good for Black Americans? Let me explain something to you, okay? The status of black people in this country was defined in law in the Dred Scott decision of 1757. Now, I went to 1857. I want y'all to pay attention to this, all right? Because one of the things you need to know about me is that now ignorance is not a deal breaker because I'm a compulsive pedagogue. You know, I can't help teaching, all right? And I like it, okay? And if you are ignorant and humble, Fine. Thus far, he just asked the question. Yeah, he's humble. It, it is abominably ignorant. And the only reason that I'm going to conduct myself in the civil way I am is because I suspect it's asked in honest no, ignorance. No, no, okay, yeah, so no, let, me, let me explain mm -hmm. something to you. What ought to be obvious is this. We live in a constitutional participatory democracy. Nothing in this country will get done if you cannot pass laws to do it. If it, if it, if it and, 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 and if you can't pass laws to do it, if you can't or have any part in electing the people who are going to make the laws. Do you know what, in, in, in 1857, in the Dred Bred Scott decision, the Supreme Court said that the, the, the protections of the Constitution were never intended for black people, that that black men had no rights in America that a white man was bound to respect. That's what the Supreme Court said in the 7-2 to two decision. Do you have any idea what it was like? Read something. Read something. Read the life and times of Frederick Douglass. See what that was like. No citizenship rights at all. So when the Civil War came, and the Civil War was a haphazard affair, the nation blundered into it. But once the war started, 
Lincoln, in the beginning, Lincoln was a free sort, which meant that he was concerned with, just concerned with, 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 with containing slavery where it was in the South. He didn't want it to spread into the free territories because he grew up a poor working boy. And he understood that you cannot compete with people that don't get paid at all. So he was a, 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 a representative of white workers. He, he was a free sort. However, in the course of the struggle, he became an abolitionist. I tell you what, go to C-SPAN Book World, put my name in it, and there's a lecture recently that I gave at the University of Massachusetts sponsored by the History Department called A Tribute to Professor Stephen Oates. You should listen to my presentation. You should listen to my presentation. Without voting rights, we have no power in this country at all, okay? When, when, when slavery ended abruptly as a result of the Civil War and, and, and Lincoln passing the Emancipation Proclamation, but the South didn't pay no attention to that until they were defeated in the Civil War. So all of a sudden, four million black people who were in bondage are suddenly free. Now, a lot of you armchair militants like to sit around and say, well, they weren't really free. Yeah, if your ass had been a slave, you know, you would know the difference. You understand? And I had people in my family who, who were slaves and used to talk about slavery times. So I don't want to hear none of you little poop butts, you know, talking about, well, they weren't really free. Yes, they free, yes, from chattel slavery. Chattel slavery was over. Now, the question was, what is going to be the status of black people, these newly freed people in American society? That's what the radical reconstruction is about. That's when the radical Republicans, because then the Republicans were the party of Lincoln and they were the progressive party. That is when they took over the reconstruction and had the period we call radical reconstruction from around 1866 to 1877. During that period, the first question that had to be decided where black people are concerned was, what is going to be our status in American society? We're no longer slaves, but our status is still governed by the Dred Scott decision, which says we have no rights at all. And that wasn't just intended for slaves, that was intended for all black people, slave and free. So the question was, what is going to be the status of black people in this society? And they decided that the first thing we've got to do is to make the abolition of slavery permanent because the Emancipation Proclamation was a, an executive order issued in wartime. The next president could have reversed it and we would have been back in slavery. The only way to prevent that from happening was to make it a constitutional amendment. So the first order of the Reconstruction Radical Republicans was to get the 13th Amendment passed to make slavery permanently illegal in the United States, everywhere. The second question was to protect the rights that black people had gained. So the 14th Amendment does the following. It addresses the issue raised in Dred Scott by saying everybody born on American soil is automatically a citizen. That's the reason why the Republicans right now want to repeal parts of the 14th Amendment because they talk about anchor babies, about immigrants coming here, pregnant and having babies, and their babies are automatically American citizens. That's because of the 14th Amendment. In the 14th Amendment, but there's another part of the 14th Amendment that's even, this, even equally critically important, and that is the Equal Protection Clause. The Equal Protection Clause is specifically designed to make certain that black people have all the rights that, and, 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 and privileges that white people have. And it spells it out. All the rights, privileges, immunities, everything. It spells it out. And so... Hold, hold on, let me yeah. finish. Mm -hmm. And then, critical to this, okay, you, you made slavery permanent. You, you, you settled the question of citizenship of a black American. You have put in place constitutional amendment that spells out the, our, our equal rights. So what was the last thing to do to make us whole? Give us the right to vote. That's what the 15th Amendment is. It's this series of acts that made us whole. 
when black Americans got the right to vote, they voted all them Southern crackers out of office. See, that's why you, you know you had a black governor of the state of Mississippi, Blacks Council Bruce. You had to have a black governor of, 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 of a black senator from, from Mississippi, a black governor of Louisiana, Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback. You know, uh, you had, you know, black congressmen, you had black sheriffs all over the South. Queen Mother's daddy was a sheriff. You know what I'm saying? It, all, all of this made possible because black people got the vote. And then, and then they managed to take a lot of these things back through Supreme Court decisions. And to show you how idiotic the question is about black people voting. If black people had turned out to vote for Hillary Clinton the way they turned out to vote for Obama, we wouldn't have all these assholes on the Supreme Court now. All right? They would not have reversed Roe versus Wade, and we don't know what the hell else they're going to reverse. They're going to get rid of affirmative action very quickly, and what that will mean is that white people can just hire white people again all the time and don't have to consider us no matter what our qualifications. All because, all because black people didn't know they should take their fucking ass out and vote. And vote for the Democratic Party. Don't tell me. I mean, I heard all kind of idiotic shit about, oh, Hillary, she was responsible for the incarceration of all these young black men. And she called young black men super predators. They were super predators. She was talking about crack dealers. Makeda was a child during the crack play. The shit got so bad, me and the guys in here who were veterans, you know, and decided to arm ourselves and start taking these motherfuckers out ourselves. That's how bad it got. I took McCain and her brother down to Washington to, to, to lobby for that crime bill. And it got rid of these crack dealers around here because otherwise I might have been in jail like Rap Brown for sticking some of them motherfuckers up. I mean, I'm a sack trained killer. You understand? I'm a government trained killer. They taught me I was in a unit whose job was to seek out and destroy Russian nuclear saboteurs. I am a bad man. You understand what I'm saying? She ain't never seen that side of me. You understand what I'm saying? But I'm, you know, I'm a dangerous man, okay, if I want to be, right? And so I was on the verge, we were on the verge of going out here taking these motherfucking crack dealers off, these punk-ass mother. We were soldiers. We was going to go out and take them off. That crime bill got rid of them. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know nobody who went to jail under that bill because I don't know nobody who was selling dope. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And there's some people who went to when jail. When you say selling dope, you're talking about crack? Well, yeah, they crack. Oh, you mean yeah, weed? Yeah, crack. It was crack mostly, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, I was... No, no, no. People who went to jail for weed, see, the Republicans snuck that in the bill. You know what I'm saying? That wasn't a part of the original bill. But we live in a we live in a in a, in a we live in a participatory democracy. The way the American government works, if you want to pass a bill, if you don't have the votes, you got to compromise. No, no, I'm yeah. not glad so, you explained yeah, it. No, 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 no. They so, ask, because people don't, people nowadays just talk about the no, crime bill as if it's just like a lot of people up for No, weed. man, yeah. no. The point is, is that no. The, the thing is, is that I've always like I told you, I've written, I've won the first award, you know, from the Tom Foucault Award for writing my writing against the marijuana laws. But this was a problem with crack. We had crack dealers. It sounded like a rock around here. Automatic weapons going off and what have you. Understand what I'm saying? You know, I, I, we had to get rid of them. And if, and if the state uh, powers of the state didn't do it, we were going to have to do it. That's why H. Rap Brown is sitting in jail right now for, t for taking on these uh, drug dealers with, with guns. And he ends up shooting a dirty cop, you know, and now he's in jail for life. You know, so 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 I, so people who be talking and shit about, you know, yeah, we can't vote for Hillary. So you didn't vote for Hillary, and we got this asshole, you know, Donald Trump, and he's about to throw the country into a civil war. Well, he was. He, he, he he's already screwed up the, the judicial system. There's no telling what could happen, but he has got the country on the verge of civil war. So one thing I wanted to say too, a lot of people are unaware of the fact that the Black Panther Party started in Lawrence, Lawrence County. In Lawrence County, Alabama. The Black Panther Party was a, 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 a political party designed to elect people in the Black Belt of Alabama, Selma, Lowndes County. And it was Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap Brown who came up with the, with the Black Panther Party uh, uh, symbol. You know, and it was Stokely 
who shouted out black power on a march, on the Selma march. And it just resonated all over the country. Let me tell y'all something. You need to do some reading, right? And one of the books you need to read is Ready for Revolution, the autobiography of Stokely Carmichael, written with Mike Thelwell. I mean, there's so much ignorant prattle around with all of these books out here. You know, you have to educate yourself. I am a, a stickler for self-education. I have been, I've held professorships in two different areas. I've spoken at the leading universities here and in Europe. And I don't have a college degree. I dropped out of college after my first year. I am what they call an autodidact. I'd never heard of the word until I got tired of the professor who called me an autodidact, which means I'm self-taught. But so was Benjamin Franklin. So was Benjamin Banneker, the great black scientist. So was William Shakespeare. So was James Baldwin. So was uh, Harold Cruz, one of the greatest theoretical thinkers you know, of the 20th century in his, in, in, in his marvelous book, The Christ of the Negro Intellectual. So it's whether you put the work in. You don't need to be in school to study. I am what they call an organic intellectual. That's what Professor Herman Beavers at the University of Pennsylvania called me when they brought me down to do some lectures one of the leading universities in the world, after I'd written a book on Du Bois, which incidentally, you should go on C-SPAN and look at my lecture on Dr. Du Bois. You know, me and Stanley Cross discuss our book on Dr. Du Bois. You want to see somebody, a really great man, a really great man? Go on C-SPAN book world and put my name in there, you know, and, 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 and reconsidering the souls of black folk and listen to my lecture there and the discussion that follows with me and Stanley in the audience. You know, it's a National Black Writers Conference. You know, um, but I, 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 have, I have no respect for people who do not wish to uh, increase their knowledge of the world, you know, uh, who are content to blunder through life as if this is some kind of fucking joke. You know, we got, you, we got one life, you know, and any black person who don't understand, listen, people died for the right for black people to vote in the 1960s after they took the vote away again. And they did it through the Supreme Court. This is the thing about it. When, they, when I try to tell people, listen, it's the court, stupid. You vote for Democrats because of the court. If Hillary Clinton had been president, we would have had a very progressive Supreme Court because Hillary Clinton is a brilliant lawyer. Okay? Robert Reich, who's a professor at Berkeley, you know, he was in the same law class with Hillary at Yale. Clarence Thomas was in the class. He's on the Supreme Court. Bill Clinton was in the class. Robert Reich said that when the professor came out there and put one of those very complex legal problems before the class, the first hand that went up was Hillary's. And she was always right. She said, he said Clarence Thomas was scared to see. He didn't say a fucking word through the whole class. He didn't say nothing. And that Bill Clinton was a slacker compared to Hillary, all right? She was the star at Yale Law School, okay? She would have put great Supreme Court justices on the court and we would be moving on in progress. Instead, we're in a situation where we could go backwards. Let me tell you how far backwards we can go depending upon how the Supreme Court chooses to read the law. Let's take the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, as I pointed out, was designed to be, make sure that Afro-Americans had all the rights that white people had. You know what, what they did with it? There's a case called Plessy versus Ferguson. This is a case where a guy named Homer Plessy, a real light-skinned brother from, 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 from uh, Louisiana, was taking a train from Plaquemine to Hermitage, Louisiana. In 1896, they told him that he was a colored man and he, he, should, he should move to a certain segment of the car. Now, this is before there was any such thing as Jim Crow laws. Now, we're operating under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So, Plessy told him to kiss his ass. You know, he wasn't leaving. You know, he had a first-class ticket. That's where he was going to sit. So they ejected him from the train, and he sued the company. That's what Plessy versus Ferguson is about. 
the enforcement of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. You know what the Supreme Court said? You know what the Supreme Court says, says in Plessy versus Ferguson? You can look it up and read it for yourself. It said, it admitted that black people were guaranteed equal protection under the Constitution, but then they went on to say that neither in the letter nor the spirit of the law was it ever intended that social commingling should be forced upon parties that were not mutually agreeable to it. So yes, black people have the right to have everything equal, but it can be separate. That's why they call it the separate but equal decision. There was another decision made here too, because there was another part of Plessy's argument that doesn't get much attention. Plessy was what they used to call an octoroon. If you've ever seen uh, Adam Clayton Powell, the great uh, congressman from New York, Adam Clayton Powell was an octoroon. That is, they look, you, are, you can't, unless you on the inside, but what Du Bois used to call life behind the veil, unless you're one of us, white folks can't tell at all. You know what I'm saying? So, um, Plessy argued, he said, look, first of all, the Equal Protection Clause guarantees everybody equal rights. But even if you were going to, if you are going to discriminate against Negroes, I'm not black. I'm seven eighths white. I'm more white than I am black. They ignored his ass. And what they made clear was that they were making no distinctions between unmixed and mixed blood uh, uh, are non-whites. And, 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 and that's where that one drop rule shit comes from, right? Yeah, is... yeah, that's where that shit comes from. But and and as it turns as it turns out, that's been a blessing for us because it has welded us into one rainbow people with a particular consciousness. Because race in America is an intellectual construct; it's not real anywhere from a from a physiological point of view, but from a sociological point of view, it is. And since it's sociology, not biology, that determines how people behave, then race is real and it's important. But I'm talking about as a biological is biologist fiction, okay? Now, so in, 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 in if you look at black people everywhere else in the world where black and where Africans and Europeans have lived side by side for years, everywhere else in the world, black folk are confronted with a very complex problem, color problem, because you have these different categories based upon gradations of color. Like among Puerto Ricans, they talk about black or negro and trigueño, you know. Yeah, they, 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 they have morena, negra. Yeah, negra. yeah, see, yeah, see, they got all these different things. And depending upon where you fit in that color scheme, at one point, it mattered, you know. And the, the thing that a lot of people don't realize, too, about Latin, Spanish-speaking countries, like, Negra means black and morena means brown, but also negra is associated with being a slave. Yes. And morena is associated with being a free black, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that they have these, you know, so that, that's why... In that's another thing. Yeah. Speaking of the race problem among Latin Americans. Mm -hmm. Latin America is more racist than the United States. Mm -hmm. You used to always uh, tell me that when yeah, I was a kid. And yeah. It's absolutely true. Yeah, they're more racist. And, but see, it's a different kind of racism. It's a more insidious racism. Yeah. You know? Like, for instance, in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, the court refused to make any distinctions between mixed and unmixed blacks. But say, in Brazil, they do. You know, and, 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 and in other places... Everywhere they, in Latin America, they, they do. Yeah, everywhere in Latin America. Not only everywhere in Latin America, but everywhere in the English-speaking Caribbean and whatnot, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very strong in Jamaica and mm -hmm. whatnot. You know, and, and, and Barbados, all of them. You know, so they've got these... We've got these triple or quadruple color caste systems. And so they all divided. You know, whereas we operate as one... In, 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 in some of these Latin countries, people like Adam Clayton Powell, W.B. Du Bois... Like, a lot of them wouldn't have been considered black. Yeah, like the 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 the, the, the singer um, Vanessa Williams, she would not be considered black in any Spanish. Not language. only Vanessa Williams, what's her name? Uh, 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 Lisa Keys, you know, Alicia Keys. Yeah. She's a classic mulatto. Yeah, you know? or, or, yeah. or Meghan Markle. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Meghan Markle in some places would be considered white. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So 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 the thing about it is, is that 
among these Latin Americans, you know, when they're coming here, you know what I'm saying, they're bringing their racial attitudes with them. You know what I'm saying? And that's going to be a problem for us. You know, that's just a fact. If you have any doubt about it, Professor Henry Louis Gates of Harvard has an excellent series called Black in Latin America. And he goes to every country in Latin America. And when he gets in these countries, he gets with the leading scholars on race relations in these countries. You know what I mean? And you will see what race relations are like in every country in Latin America. You know, and it's free. It's on YouTube. So, you know? so okay. So somebody first. I, I just want to say that I hate. I hate the term black and brown. Like when people say black and brown people. Yeah. I can't stand that because I'm like, what are you talking about? Because a lot of times when, people, when they say brown people, I guess they're referring to Spanish speaking people. But it makes no sense because Spanish speaking people can be white. They can be indigenous. They can be you know like African black or any mixture of that. But also like black Americans are many different shades. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So that black and brown thing to me is retarded and misleading and confusing. But because most people when they say black and brown, they mean uh, you know, black Americans and Hispanics. So somebody said that they he said that in Texas they barely see brown marching with us. So I'm, I'm I know he's meaning the Hispanics in Texas, they barely see marching with black people. And one thing I'm going to say is that I feel like New York is unique because of the fact that you have more of a unity between blacks and Spanish speaking groups. But a lot of other places in the US, like, you know, in LA and in Miami and Chicago. Well you saw you saw this big scandal in LA just recently where yeah. three or four of these Mexican American uh, city council people had to resign. Yeah. Because they're just talking all that racist shit and it was recorded. They didn't know they were being recorded. Mm -hmm. You know, and it got out. You know, and they had to resign. I mean, real racism, and not just against black Americans, but against indigenous Indians from Mexico. Yeah. The indigenous and, 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 and that's yeah. exactly the reason why I yeah. like the term black and brown, because a lot of times people put all Hispanics in one group. All Hispanics are not a homogenous group. Hispanic is, a, it's first not a of all, is Hispanic is an illusion. It just means yeah. that they speak Spanish. Yeah, yeah so, that's what it means. They know? speak Spanish. It and, doesn't say anything else about it. Listen, there are white people in Latin America just like they're white people here. Exactly. You I've know? heard Hispanic people. Because yeah. people, yeah. yeah. so many people have said, oh, those Cubans in Miami think they're white. I'm like, they are white. They're yeah, white right. Cubans. Yeah, they are white. Those yeah, Cubans right. in Miami are white. Yeah, they are white. They're, they're, and they act white, too. Yeah, and, and I grew up, you know, growing up in the Heights, the Dominicans, when I, when I, I was talking to my mom about this last night, because when I was a kid, it was so confusing to me, because people looked like me and my, everybody looked like me and my family, okay? But they were speaking Spanish. And I'm a kid, and I'm hearing Spanish all day, all day, all day, and I was so confused. And I used to say to my dad, I thought that person was black. And he's like, they are black. They're black Dominican. You know, you can be a black Dominican or a white Dominican or a Chinese Dominican, just like you can be a black American, a white American, or a Chinese American. Dominican is a nationality, not a race. And people always put Latinos and Hispanics in this one category, like there's, you have this one visual for them. If you go to a mall in Colombia, you, you couldn't, and you're... You don't hear anything. You can't tell you're not in the mall somewhere in America. People look all kinds of ways. There's Chinese people. There's white people. There's black people. There's indigenous and every other mix of it. You know what I'm saying? So, like, that's why when people try to put them, you know, um, in this one group. It's not all. You got white Mexicans. Let me you know? say this. Um, the next time, we, we, we're going to do, I'm going to do several. I did this brief piece on Donald Trump earlier, you know, about the night I partied with him. But um, when we were both in big time boxing business, but I'm going, I have some scathing critical uh, political critiques of Trump. You know, I have one I wrote seven years ago called, Is Donald Trump a Uniquely American Fascist? It reads like prophecy now, because I said this motherfucker was just like Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, and turns out he is, you know, except Hitler had better taste in art and shit than Trump does. You know, I mean, I ain't never seen Trump. Trump lived in New York, the artistic capital of the world. Andrew Carnegie has his name on all kinds of things. Ronald Rose built the the, 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 the building here. He built Jazz and Lincoln Center. He gave that, that, that hall to the people of New York. You know, uh, 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 Rose Hall, it's marvelous. You know, uh, all glass, you can see all over these side. And perfect acu acoustics. I, I did a, you know, very good reporting on it when it opened, you know, uh, radio special. I'm going to put it online. I'm put it on YouTube so people can see it. But anyway, the thing is, is that Donald Trump has no interest in art or culture. None. He's a hick from the sticks. 
You understand? He's from out there in Queens with all the matters, is, you know, material shit. You understand? He came to New York, Manhattan. You know, he was lost in the sauce here. You know, and his father was stayed out of Manhattan. His father always felt like Manhattan was over his head. His father ended up making almost a billion dollars out there in Queens and Brooklyn. But Trump, he wanted to be a star in the city, in Manhattan. Like somebody say, uh, Mookie used to like to say, yeah, they told me they was the best in the country. I'm just trying to find out worth a, worth a damn in the city. So he see this so close of Trump. You know, his daddy was, you know, a big boy out there in the, in the boonies, in the outer boroughs, but he was scared to come to Manhattan. But Donald Trump, he came here, that was his obsession, to be accepted by the Manhattan elite. And he never really was. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know? can't stand yeah he never really was. Yeah. That's the reason why he's so ostentatious. All that vulgar gold shit in that Trump Tower. That shit looked like, you know, some kind of mausoleum or something. You know, he has no taste at all. Um, you know? Yeah. Hit Hitler was a great fan of Wagner, you know, the most complex composer of the of the of the Romantic era. He funded Beirut, the big festival, the big Wagnerian festival, which is still going on right now. When the Nazis invaded Paris, he gave strict orders not to destroy any of the architecture or artwork in Paris. And when that picture you see of Hitler driving into Paris with his open car, the first stop he wanted to make was the Paris Opera House. And if you've never seen it, go online and look at it and see why he wanted to stop there, because it's an architectural model, model, model right? But Trump don't even see shit like that. You understand what I'm saying? So he's got all of Hitler's uh, vices and none of his virtues. You understand what I'm saying? I can't think of any virtue that Donald Trump has. The only thing I can think of that Donald Trump ever did that I agree with or said was when he said that NATO was a, 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 a dangerous and costly anachronism. He was right about that. And I've written extensively about it and I talked two hours about it yesterday. Yep. <clears throat> so thank you guys for listening. We've been talking a lot today. This is um the third video because we're doing this on IG Live and you get an hour before the video runs out if you want to save it. And then the second time, the second video, somebody called and interrupted. So this is the third take. So make sure you watch the two videos prior to this. And I will post If you want to get an education. Watch the first two, yeah. right? Because I've been dropping science for almost three hours, you know. And I don't yeah. mean the kind of bullshit you use to hear on these uh, uh, social media. Yeah. I'm talking about real science. I'm dropping real science. And I'm a real scholar. Yeah, there is a lot of bullshit. And that, that's one of the reasons why I was inspired to do um, these videos. Because... Um, because there's too much, I mean, I feel like there's too much stupidity. I feel like most people don't read, okay? And I feel like um, there's, you know, there's pros and cons to the internet and YouTube and everything, but there's so many stupid people with like a million followers and it's just people don't read and people just believe in dumb shit. And so I'm just like, yeah. Um, I definitely, you know, grew up around intellectuals and critical thinkers and, you know, I'm constantly reading and studying and I like facts. And so those of you who follow me know that I like to educate. Um, and I'm always saying I'm an intellectual. She's like me. She's a compulsive pedagogue. You know what that means? It means that we are genetically predisposed to fight ignorance wherever we encounter it. That's what it means. And it means that we have a low tolerance for bullshit and do not accept foolishness, do not uh, 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 tolerate foolishness gladly. All fools. You know, so... Uh, that's this. Uh, she's my daughter. She's just like me. Mm -hmm. You know, I raised her with my own hand. Mm -hmm. In fact, I named her. Yeah, he did name me. Yeah, I named her Michaela. You know why? Because I wanted her to feel empowered from the time she was a little girl. And Michaela is one of the most powerful women in history. Michaela was the beautiful black queen of Sheba. The one who, in the Bible, is talked about in the Song of Solomon. The one who was so brilliant, charming, and alluring that she caused King Solomon, who had 10,000 wives, to walk away from them all for her. Not only that, she got him to turn against God for her. That's who I named my daughter after. And I've been telling her that since she was a little girl. So any of y'all who, you know, be looking at her video and stuff and see she, you know, kind of caked up and stuff and you want to be talking shit, just know, you know, that you can't come with her with no weak game. Right? You got to, you know, you got to have some substance. Because I'm the model 
that she using for what a man ought to be. So you see, see, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's true. I was about to say something. I forgot what it. It was something I forgot. But poop butts need not apply, right? Poop butts need not apply. No, this is true. That's why when people see like I don't have a, a I don't have a high tolerance for stupidity, and it, it comes it comes it does come from my dad. Um, uh, he's a lot. I mean, I'm a lot like him, you know. And he's calmer in his older years. Um, Am I really? Oh. Of course. When we were growing up, you used to get, there was so many times you used to be cursing people out. Me and my twin brother, we got uh, immune to being embarrassed. We used to be places that we could tell, like you having a conversation with somebody and they said something stupid. They said the wrong thing. And me, <laughs> and me and my twin brother, we'd be like, oh no, this person does not know what, who they're talking to, what's about to happen, what they're getting into. And, you know, and then I remember being a little girl, I think it was at the Grambling game in the press box. You got an argument with this white dude about something. And then I remember when we left, you said to me, listen, Makeda, don't you ever feel like, you know, when you're around white people, like you don't have something to say. Don't ever make them feel like you don't have something to say. And you, and you would say all the time, I'm not intimidated by these white boys. They couldn't walk a day in my shoes. And you used to always you Remember know, the day mm -hmm. when we were over at the Great Museum of Natural History and we were looking at this show. They, they, you know, the Museum of Natural History in New York is one of the great institutions for um, study of the extinction of species. My son uh, went there for junior high school. We used to have a staff pass. You know, we could go all the way back and watch the taxidermists put these animals together. Um, her twin brother. Uh, but um, I don't even remember what I was saying. I have um, so many thoughts running around. I know, and, that, that happens to me yeah, too. And plus, I've been smoking this high grade now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I know whatever I was saying, it was something serious, you know what I mean? I got the sidetracked. Oh, we were over there mm -hmm. at the museum. Mm -hmm. And this professor was there, and he was giving this lecture on the extinction of species. And he had a graph. And he showed that from beginning with the 1850s, the rate of extinction of species accelerated. You could see it, you know, on the chart. Mm -hmm. And he said, is there anybody in here could tell, can, can tell me why that was the case? And we were the only black people in there, you know? And uh, all these white folk standing looking clueless. I raised my hand, I said, I can explain it. I said, the Industrial Revolution took place and began to poison the ad, uh, put all these toxic chemicals into the, into, the, into the environment. And he said, yes, this is right. And I told McKay then, I said, listen, you know, don't ever assume that you ain't the smartest one in the room, you know, because uh, 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 anybody, these people are smarter than you. You may not be the smartest one in the room, but until somebody show me that ain't the case, <laughs> that, that, yeah. That's how I feel. You yeah, know and, I mean? I've, and yeah. I've, I've never been intimidated. But yeah, the video is ending. And so a lot of you have been asking me. I will put my dad's uh, blog below and his Facebook page because he is on Facebook. You can find him on Facebook. Um, and you can find him on YouTube. So I'll put some of the links below um, on the YouTube and on my IG. And he's also starting a YouTube channel, even though I feel like we should start one together too. That might well, happen. maybe so, but yeah, I, that I just happen. want one to just do my yeah, comments. No, no, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, you need one. Yeah. And I'm not even going to have that open to comment because I don't care what people think. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. So, your your um, site is Playthel's Commentaries. Yeah, but now there's no, there's no apostrophe. Yeah, no. It's P-L-A-Y-T-H-E-L-L-S. S. Commentaries. C-O-M-M. C-O-M-M-E-N. T A R I E S dot WordPress dot com. Dot com. Yeah, yeah. I'll put and it when up. you go on there, go go to go first to Place Out Benjamin Independent Public Intellectual because then you get a chance to see my bio. Yep. You see, you see what qualifies me on be, me being on here talking all this shit. You see? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for listening, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you in the next video. If you learned something from this, please like it and please share it, okay? Because we're on a, a mission of education. What are all these people saying? They, they've said, well, the video's about to end, but people have been, um, when is the next conversation taking place? 
I have to head back to Chicago tomorrow. I wanted to do one with him tomorrow before I leave if I have time, but I'm not sure. But if not, we're going to...